Hi, I'm Colin. Uh, how many of you did your first time in Code and Supply? Right. Well, the first time here. First time yeah. here. Okay. Um, how many of you is this your first time at a Code and Supply event ever? Ding. Cool. Cool. Great. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you are in a parking space. Um, this parking space is um, is owned by Code and Supply. Um, so do keep in mind that there are people who may be still be working here, um, and also that there are some private areas um, that you don't want to mess around with things on people's desks. Um, things that are kind of open to the community to uh, grab some of the food and whatnot and make them and such. Um, the restrooms are back that way if you're meeting. Um, and uh, you probably know approximately where the exits are because you can see it. Um, things that are going on in March. This is March. Um, take a look at our events calendar. Um, this is simply a, a capture of everything that's going on in the space. So what you see here is what is on Meetup plus what is on a few other Meetups that also um, if you are here, the Ides of March is tomorrow, beware. Um, and then um, many other things going on um, for the rest of the month. Um, as well as things going on next month, these are the organizations that are currently meeting up in this space. Um, and of course, we would be remiss to not talk about abstractions. Um, abstractions is the 2,000 plus person um, software conference that Code and Supply is putting on in August. Um, many of the organizers are here. Jenny is one of our organizers, as well as Justin, myself, and Sarah. And I think that's all that I see this year. Um, there's a few others. Uh, if you are interested in speaking at Abstractions, the CFP is currently open. Um, I think it is open through the 24th, Justin? Yep. Yes. Uh, through the through the 24th, if you're interested in speaking, please do submit. We like to see submissions. Um, we don't be don't be intimidated by this being your first submission, by it being your 100th submission. Um, we want to get uh, submissions from everybody in all um, varieties of experience and interest and topics and everything. Yeah, this may seem like a simple question, but I've always wondered because it seems unclear to me. What's the scope of this of talks that you'll find at the abstractions? Oh, excellent question. So abstractions is a multidisciplinary conference, meaning you're going to see talks from um, design, development, management, career management, how to how to build a good career, um, to running a business, to um, some like more what we call distractions things like yoga, um, spending some time with therapy dogs, um, and these kinds of these kinds of activities are things that we're interested in. Um, with with uh, the develop with with uh, things that get into development, anything of open game. Um, we really like to see things on security and DevOps. Those are pretty popular topics, as well as data science. Um, data science is pretty much. Um, something that's exploding in Pittsburgh over about the last five or six years, so we want to make sure that um, that community is being well served. I would add on to that also that uh, I didn't hear Colin say about community. Um, so we really care about talks that talk about how to build a good community, how to keep, keep a safe community, how to keep a safe workspace, and all of those different talks. We've had, uh, at our previous abstractions, we had a few about uh, interviewing and how to have healthier interviews and things about mental health and making sure that people don't get burnt out in tech. Um, and I think those are some of those important topics that no one covers. So, sorry, Ted. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's, um, we would love to see more talks on, on that. Um, if you're interested in sponsoring, if you work for a company that is hiring or wanting to sell talks to developers, Please do talk to me. That's my job to get uh, abstractions or the space. Mm -hmm. um, are we are we ready to go? Um, just a second. Yes, we're ready to go. Excellent. Um, Jenny, are you ready? Sure. All right. So, uh, without further ado, 
um, my good friend, Amy Manning. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry for the delay, and thank you for waiting. Um, so I am going to be talking about how some of our modern languages, the history of them. So the talk is, Mommy, where do programming languages come from? I found that when I was a student at college, I learned C and C++ and learned a good amount about the assembler and things of that sort, but I never really found out how Ruby was invented or where a lot of things came from. So I really enjoyed uh, getting to learn about these things and reading up on them. Next slide, why are you not there? Okay, um, so my name is Jenny Manning. I am a software engineer, a conference organizer, as Colin said previously, and a dog mom. I love my dog a lot. She will be in the photo in a few times. Sorry about that. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at J41Manning. So in the beginning, so in the, in this image, we have on the far left in the forties, things of ENAC, which was used in World War II for debugging, or not debugging, decoding uh, messages, machine languages, Zeus, which is a very rarely known language. Uh, it was the first programmable computer built um, but it was destroyed two years after it was built because uh, uh, Conan Zu Conrad Zeus is a German engineer who was living in Berlin during the war. So his first computer got ex destroyed in a bomb. And then six months later, all of his other things got destroyed in a different bombing. So it wasn't found his research wasn't really found and implemented very much until about the 70s, even though he was really, really far ahead of his time. Uh, so we have the assembly languages and uh, short code, which was some of the beginnings of changing things to not have to use as much of, not to be less architecture dependent. So each assembly language, I'm not sure how much people know about this, uh, each assembly language depended on the architecture ar of your computer. So this, my Mac might not be the same thing as someone else's computer, and you would have to rewrite your program each time you were on a different computer architecture and things had not converged at all. So that was a very painful time, and a lot of people were starting to try and change that, <laughs> starting to try and change that uh, so that they didn't have to be rewriting this over and over again. Um, and also this image uh, is from Land of Lisp, for the record. Um, and yeah. Uh, so a little bit after that, more of like the 60s and 70s. Um, so we start to get Fortran and Cobalt were the ones that everyone knew. Uh, Fortran 76, I believe, was the most used language once it became, once it was out. Uh, this was around the time when there was meetings about what standards should be had. Uh, the American, American Standard Association decided what rules to, what things to follow so that they were converging on an architecture and set standards for what, for what languages built after that point had to adhere to. Um, so you didn't have to keep reinventing the wheel over and over again. So uh, I'm going to point out Simula is flying up there right now, and there's some things about Lisp people. Uh, so Simula is uh, very influential for other languages, but was not very used at the time. Um, so Fortran is essentially just an abstraction of assembly, uh, and it was invented in 50, 1954 at IBM. Um, and it was a compiled language that allowed named variables, complex expressions, and things that we view commonplace but do not have at all. Um, and it really influenced Algol a lot, which is not on this one. Yeah. But, but Algol is 1960. Well, well Fortran's before. Uh, Fortran, uh, the original Fortran was in... Uh, 54 and Algol was, well, it was 
50s, 60s. They kind of, it all becomes a muddy uh, blend. We can talk about specifically Fortran and uh, Algol and how each influenced the other because I'm sure there was a lot of back and forth and I would love to have that discussion afterwards if you would like. So uh, if we look at, this is from the Octoverse from this past year. If we look at the top languages over time, and this is what GitHub uses. So this shows languages that are used on open source or things of that sort. So I'm sure there's a lot of different languages that are missing from here. Uh, we mentioned Cobalt, and it said that 80%, there's data out there that's 80% of business uh, machine, like, Programs related to business run on a variant of COBOL. I'm not sure how true that is, but uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of old code out there, and th but this is what people are using currently. So we're gonna focus on these ones. JavaScript, Java, Python, C++, C, and Ruby. Um, Ruby has very much dropped in the last few years. Um, and I will post these slides later. So for the record, if you see a little link or if you see an icon, that's a clickable link um, and can take you to the data from this. Okay, so let's look at programming languages. Uh, that's not very good. Let's try looking at it a different way. Mm, okay, let's look at a smaller view. Okay. Let's look at, this is a simplified tree of how we are, the languages we're focusing on. So we have C going into C++ and down to Python. Python going down and influencing Go. Java to JavaScript. Smalltalk is very important. It was the first object-oriented programming language. Um, goes down to Python or Ruby and over to C++. Uh, and Haskell is off on its own because Haskell is influential in all of the functional languages. So I thought it would, even though it's very different than the other languages, it was very, it's important to talk about. Hmm. So I'm going to go back one slide for a second. So this visualization, I'm going to be using excerpts from it. So I'm just going to talk about it for a moment. Uh, and I actually will share the data th from this because it's ac it's amazing and uh, very, very interesting. It was published in December 2018, so it's very recent. Um, so the, co the colors are based off of how they are connected to each other uh, based off of Lovin's method, and uh, the size of it is how much it's influenced other languages. So I'm just pointing that out for when we see them later. So there might be influential ones that are never used, etc. So a language that doesn't have everything is easier to program in than some that do. Dennis Ritchie. So Dennis Ritchie started working on C in 1969 at Bell Labs. Uh, it came out in uh, 1972. So here is and all the things that it has influenced and influenced it. Uh, there are arrows going each way. Um, so Fortran was one of the, a big influencer of C uh, and also CBL, which is, was initially Cambridge programming language, uh, but became combined programming language uh, and was released in 1963, which then was inspired B CPL in by uh, Martin Richards in 1967, which then became B, which then became C, so or spawns. Uh, naming is so good. Half of these are blank programming languages if they have PL in them. Uh, they were very inventive with names at that time. So B was invented by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Uh, Ken Thompson is a name we will hear again later for other inventors. Uh, and B, the interesting thing about uh, BCPL and what some of the major things that came out of it for C is it was the first introduction of curly braces. 
Um, it used the virtual machine to compile to bytecode and was the first use of a Hello World program. That was the first time it was ever Hello World. It also uh, introduced the concept of double slash for comments. That was the first time we saw that and has been used in other languages since then. Uh, so C itself was released in 1972 um, and it was created in Bell Labs to, with the intent to reinvent the Unis, Unix operating system. Uh, they wanted to rewrite the kernel and didn't want to be doing it in machine code. So they thought that they would write a language to make it easier to rewrite the Unix kernel. So that's why C was initially written. So languages around this time were mostly imperative. Uh, so this was a bit of a change. Uh, we're imperative or procedural programming uh, because pr uh, the processors of that time uh, had the stack registry um, for calling things. So it's interesting how the paradigms have changed throughout history. Okay, let's add a little bit of class. So if no one knows, C++ was initially called C with classes. It wasn't renamed until it had been worked on for a few years. So it was started in 1979, um, but the manual for it wasn't published until 1985. And it was, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Bjorn Strupp. He's Danish. I'm trying. Um, so so uh, he was working at Bell Labs. And his first thing when he was a brand new programmer at Bell Labs was to analyze the Unix kernel with respect to dis distributed compiling, computing, sorry. Um, so he had that in mind when he started changing things and adding stuff to C. So he made his first changes that he made when he started working on C with classes was to change the C compiler um, and add in well classes and things of that sort. But he really wanted to focus on the C compiler and changing that. It was renamed after he'd been working on it for four years in 83. And that by that point, he had virtual functions, operator over overloading, constants, uh, and comments. So that was the point when the slashes were added back in. Those were not part of C. Um, so those he added those back into C++. Um, same thing. Uh, so he decided to work with C because I'm sure he was very familiar with it with all of his coworkers working in C, but he chose it because it was general purpose, fast, portable, and widely used. But he wanted to integrate Simula. That was the pterodactyl that was flying above. Um, so he wanted to take some Simula features and add it into C. So he thought that Simula had features that were really helpful for large software development, but the language was really, really slow. Um, so he thought it was not practical at all. But BCP, BCPL was really fast, but too low level for large development. So he kind of merged them together. Um, and C++ is still one of the most used languages, uh, despite coming out in 85. Um, and was used to write things initially like Microsoft Office and initially Firefox. So, it's, it's accurate. Okay, let's talk about Haskell. Um, so Haskell is one of the most different languages in how it was invented. Most of these are a company decided to do something or open source and someone decided to take it upon themselves and start working on a language, but Haskell's not that at all. So in uh, 1987, a group of people met in Portland, Oregon for the Functional Programming Languages and Computer Architecture Conference. And at this conference, they decided that they would hold a, that a committee would be formed to define an open standard for functional languages. So they, chose people and decided and defined Haskell and how they wanted functionality or functional languages to look. Uh, so the purpose was to consolidate functional languages that existed at that time to actually consolidate them into a common one uh, so they could 
use it for future research. Uh, so the first, re first version of Haskell was released in 1990. Uh, I'm not sure if this is because there was a committee and people didn't agree, but at that time they released 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4. I think there were some disagreements among what was important, but they generally agreed. Um, so, but one thing that they did go off of for doing this was going off of Miranda, which is this one. Uh, sorry, this is also, this is poorly written, but uh, ML is right here. Uh, Lazy ML, machine language. Which one? Oh, well, this one says it's lazy ML. I'm not actually sure what lazy ML is now that I look at it. Uh, a lot of these are kind of strange, but so Miranda was a big inspiration for Haskell though. So they wanted to take the semantics of it, but not the syntax. Uh, so the thing they liked about Miranda is that it was a lazy, purely functional programming language and it was designed by David Turner. Um, and by creating Haskell, they really set the standard for functional pr programming languages after this point. Any questions so far? I haven't really paused. Well, I'm just curious what Orwell is. I see it's big enough, but it's just smack right there in the middle of the I think river. going, yeah, I th it's a rabbit hole to go into all of the different small languages, I think. Okay. So this is my dog, but how did people spend, it's a little bit back, but how did most people spend Christmas break? I assume it's like this, relaxing somewhat at least. But the summer, or the summer, the December of 1989 was not the case for Guido von Rosum. Rosum? Rosum. Uh, so he ha was a PhD student at that time and was really frustrated with the programming languages he could use and was becoming more and more unhappy with how he had to work. So he went home for the holidays and decided to design Python and start coding it over his Christmas break. Um, and he probably watched a lot, a lot of Mon Monty Python over that time because that's what he named it after. So it also makes sense that it was Christmas break. So if we actually look at Python, uh, so he took a lot of things out of ABC, which is right here, okay, uh, which he said before that that's where all of his good stuff has come from, um, plus access to system calls in a different way. But he wanted something that was between shell scripting and C, and he just felt that there was not anything in that area. So he wanted something between a really, really high level and a really low level and was aiming for an intermediate high um, and wanted an interpreted language. So, but since this was a pet project and he had to go back to working on his PhD, he gave himself a time budget and said, if I'm not finished with the coding of this language, not working out the kinks, in three months, I'm not allowed to continue working on it. So he gave himself a budget of how long he was able to work on it. Um, so when he was designing it, he was aiming for I can't believe I'm not blanking on how to pronounce this word. You iterate, you iterability. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, and one of the things about Python is that it's open source. So a funny thing about Python uh, for people who've used it is you've seen the lambda reduce filter or map functions probably at some point in there. And uh, Guido has actually said in blog posts that he did not want those to be there and that they did not make any sense with the rest of Python, but he actually they only became in part of Python because a Lisp developer just kept submitting patches, adding functions that the developer wanted to use. And he was like, well, it works, so sure. Um, so that's the only reason that those are in and part of Python, because um, functional patches kept getting submitted to this repo. Yeah. Okay, so in June 91, we're getting more and more recent, uh, James Go Gosling, Mike Sheridan, and Patrick Naughton uh, started a project called Oak, or programming language named Oak, because there was a big oak tree outside of Gosling's window at work. 
And uh, this was initially thought of that it would be developed for interactive TV and that it would be this great new thing, but nothing was ready in the television world for anything like that. So in this was obviously became Java. So that was released by Sun Microsystems in 95. Uh, James Gosling is the main developer who is credited for Java. Um, he took things from, he took a lot of things from Objective-C, which took a lot of inspiration from C and Smalltalk. Uh, so he took a lot of ideas from C slash Smalltalk and Objective-C to put it in there. Um, he wanted the original features of Smalltalk, but with a syntax that was closer to C or C++. And uh, that is where the origin of just-in-time compiling comes from. Smalltalk, that is. So Smalltalk came up with the idea of just-in-time compiling, and he decided to add that into Java as well. Um, so Java is a little different because it's not an interpreted language and it's not a compiled language. It's both. Um, so another... Oh, that's unrelated, actually. Sorry, I have a note in there that shouldn't be there. Uh, so Pascal uh, was around this time, and one of the things he took from Pascal was uh, using process VRs to compile the P code, and that's where that uh, came from, um, which led into the JVM, uh, which was the write once, run anywhere slogan that Java came out with. And it compiled into Java bytecode. So I said Pascal compiled into P code, and that was the original uh, code that it compiled into, and Java said bytecode, which is now the general standard that we use. Um, and the JVM was released in 2006 for open source. So you can now go and look at the JVM that came out with that, which if people are not as familiar with Java, uh, that's the Java virtual machine, sorry. And that it was, an, virtual machines were created for the same architecture problem that we talked about before. You didn't want to be running uh, these programs on each different architecture and have to compile them down to what that architecture could support. So a virtual machine was a way to compile it down to something where it could be run everywhere, which is what Pascal came out with in the 70s. Oh, sorry. What's up? Let me help you on a little bit of that. Oh, go ahead. Um, because of all these different machine architectures that existed, compiler developers writing languages, including Tail 1 and C, Cobalt 4, and whatever, they split their compilers into two parts, in the front end and the back end. And then they would, comp and the front end would compile the high level language into a machine and then you would just compile the C code or C code. And so what Pascal's P code did wasn't a, it wasn't a, executable bytecode the way Java has a VM. It didn't run on any machine. It was a machine-independent language that then was itself compiled into assembly languages or compiled into machine code. So it was an intermediate language yeah. that made it easy to write back. And that was the, so the big difference between the Pascal's P code and, and Java's bytecode is that Java said, hey, let's take this intermediate language and just execute it directly yeah. uh, and not, uh, you know, so not compile it. That is uh, all true. Uh, my point was more so that he took the idea of having bytecode from Pascal's uh, intermediate of having P code. One other point on that. There, there was a uh, 1980 P code hardware machine also. I didn't know that. Yeah. Like a digital micro. Oh. So I'm not sure how many, I saw a few giggles when this came up. And as I said before, if you see a little icon that refers to anything. Also, I didn't actually say this before, but each of these is a link to the related image. So each of these, if you click onto it, it will take you to the page uh, where this came from and more details about that language. So this is from a Codemash lightning talk that came out in 2012 where a developer pointed out how ridiculous JavaScript is with a lot of uh, typing. We'll go with, uh, so Brandon Eich in 1995 uh, was told by work that 
he should be working on a new programming language. He was excited and thought this was awesome. And he was working for Netscape at the time. And then slightly after the project, had, or as the project was about to start ramping up, uh, Netscape decided that they wanted to have a pair of languages. So they said they wanted JavaScript to be a pair with Java. So that is why it got the name JavaScript. Um, because they wanted to collaborate with Sun Microsystems. So they said, okay, uh, can you create JavaScript? And gave him six months to do it, which is why everyone always says that's why JavaScript is the way it is. Um, but he actually did the coding itself in 10 days. So he was given six months to do it and did the coding in 10 days. I'm sure there was a lot of the rest of the, what? The rest of the five months were testing. That's how you're supposed to do it, right? So at Net, he was working at Netscape and uh, he was told that the syntax for JavaScript had to look like Java. But uh, he, so when he started working at this, he ruled out existing languages and going off of them like Scheme, Python, TLC, and Scheme. Perl, Python, <laughs> TLC, and Scheme. Uh, but initially when he was told to start the project, they said his work told him to Put ski to uh, put scheme inside a browser and just call it good. Uh, so he's like, ah. Uh. So scheme has some influence to JavaScript uh, and is the reason it has closures and uh, some the proto pal uh, inheritance. Um, but some big things that led into it were self, which is right here. So uh, self is another one that came from Smalltalk. So Smalltalk, again, first object-oriented programming language, inspired a lot of other languages that have object-oriented aspects. So Self had some of those, which went into JavaScript. Um, and clearly Java highly uh, influenced it, but mostly in the look of it. Um, so they were trying to provide a glue language at that time uh, for web, developer, or web designers and part-time programmers. Uh, to actually be able to put in scripts or applets or images. Uh, and they saw Java as too high priced for program, used by high priced programmers and didn't think that people, everyday people working on the internet and trying to build websites would want to use Java. It just wasn't as practical. Uh, so that's where they wanted to create a language for the web page designers. Um, and so they tried to make it as simple as possible and just able to copy and glue things together. Most of the languages we've talked about uh, are from the United States, Canada, uh, UK, or Germany, uh, different parts of Europe. But if we go over to the land of the rising sun, uh, so in 1993, Yukihiro Matsumoto, or Mats as he's called, uh, started working on a language called Ruby. So he was having drinks with a colleague one day in 1993 and started talking about the languages that were out there at the time. Um, and he wanted to have an object-oriented scripting language. Um, he'd seen some Perl 4 and felt it had too much of a toy language feel to it and that it wasn't really useful. Um, and Python was okay, but he felt like object-oriented was tacked on to Python as an afterthought and not really integrated into the design of it. So he didn't want to be using Python because of that. Uh, but that's why it was Python highly, or Python influenced Ruby because he did like some aspects of it. So he started working on this because he wanted an object-oriented, easy to use scripting language. And he looked around and could not find anything. So he decided to start working on it. Um, he wanted it to be more powerful than Perl and more object-oriented than Python. The aim was to make Ruby uh, natural, not simple. So some things that highly influenced uh, him when he was working on this were Perl, Smalltalk, Eiffel, which I don't actually see Eiffel listed there, which is interesting. 
uh, Ada and Lisp. I think this data is out of wrong is out of date or incorrect in a way um, because he specifically has said he's influenced by those. Uh, so he was took a lot of things from those and was trying to balance functional programming with imperative programming. Uh, an interesting thing about Ruby was that it was almost named Coral. So he was torn between the name Coral and Ruby and only chose Ruby because it was a, the person who sat next to him, their birthstone. He's like, oh, their birthstone's Ruby. Let's go with that one. It's a sign. Um, and in Ruby, everything is an object. So Ruby came out. I actually have this on the wrong slide. Okay. So in 1995, Ruby came out and was released in many different versions after that point. Uh, it wasn't until a little bit later that people started using it outside of Japan uh, because it didn't travel as much initially. But that's a, so around 96 is when people started using Ruby more and more uh, for day to day things. So this is the newest language we're talking about. Um, yeah. So uh, Go was in, came out in 2009. So we're talking not even a decade back. Uh, but it did look to Fortran for some of its implementations, uh, which is why I thought this was an appropriate thing to add. So Go was invented at Google, and it was Robert Geismer, Rob uh, Pike, and Kenneth Th Ken Thompson. And uh, I said before that we should keep that in mind when I said that Ken Thompson was one of the creators of B. So since he was a creator of that language, it highly influenced some of the uh, ways that Go is. So they started working on it in 2007, and it was released in 2009. Um, and it was designed for interior to Google, more or less. Uh, it was designed for people who have to read and write and maintain large software systems. So more or less think of how many databases Google has and how large a lot of their software is. And they felt that nothing was really uh, working well for them. So they decided to come out with Go. But they specifically, the creators had said they were aiming for it to be boring. They're like, it should not be interesting. It's supposed to be just for like reading, maintaining, debugging. There's nothing exciting. It should be boring. It should do exactly what you expect it to do. It should not be like exciting research into programming languages and really be the cutting edge thing. Um, it's compiled, concurrent, and has garbage collection and statically typed. Uh, it took a lot. It mostly took things from C, Smalltalk, and Pascal. Uh, and it is also an open source language. So Python was an open source language, and so is Go and Ruby. Um, so an interesting thing about Go is they released it and then immediately were part of a lawsuit. <laughs> yes. So uh, everyone's heard of Go, right? The other Go. So in 2003, a different language was created called Go, but it's Go with an explanation mark. And uh, they immediately sued Google for not choosing a different name, but they were suing Google and a small group of people. So it just fell apart immediately. <laughs> like the lawsuit just kind of went away. But almost immediately after it came out, there was scandal of uh, taking over a different name. So again, this is supposed to be a boring language though. It's supposed to be very clear what it's doing. It's not doing anything exciting. Uh, it's very it's supposed to be easy to read, easy to debug. And that is the end for what languages we're gonna talk about. Um, if we want to go into some of the large diagrams, there's some really fun things in there that we can take a look at. Um, any questions right now? Scala? Yeah. I take that and I, you know, I, mm. okay, Scala. Uh, and it's supposed to be based on Java, but mm -hmm. where you showed it, it was more with something else. So if we look, 
this is when it becomes uh, something like this. Uh, this is a timeline. So this is order up and down. Well, that wasn't the one. It was the smaller. I know. Can I zoom in on this one? I cannot. No. Okay. Uh, so let's go over a tab, actually. If I can, can I just do this? Oh, you have four. Sorry, I do not know how to try and swap tabs in this when it's in full screen like that. So uh, if we want to look at one, this is by year. This is a better way to look at it. Um, and this is the uh, site that I said was released in 2000 uh, or in just like two months ago in December. Um, and there's it is propagated by a Python script for pulling off of Wikipedia. Unfortunately, this did not exist when I created this, and I was really sad to find it after the fact because it would have been very useful for prep. Um, but this is where the same place where the influence network came from. And I've read up a lot about how these were generated, and I'm sure that will end up being a topic, but I did not create it, so I do not take credit. But uh, so you were asking about Scala, right? Yeah, well, I also saw fourth when I used the lots of building flight simulators. So, not to take you off topic. Yeah, let's look at Scala in this way. So, this is a little bit better of a way. I'm all caps accidentally. There we go. So, if you want to look at just the influence network. Um, so, Scala has not really influenced anything. It's very new. Um, I don't, I was hoping it would say what year it was created. Okay, so there is an influence in Java. Then yeah, no, Scala is essentially functional Java. I use Scala at work oh, okay. all of the time. But uh, Scala versus Java 8, uh, Java 8 took a lot of ideas from Scala. So okay. essentially, uh, Java 7 didn't have any form of functional languaging, and uh, creators of Scala didn't like that. So they created Scala, which has a lot of different functional aspects to it. And then the creators of Java said, ooh, we like those, and then incorporated them into Java 8, which is why Java 8 has a lot of functional aspects to it. So it's, the popularity of paradigms definitely is leading towards functional right now. And it seems like more and more languages are having functional uh, component, or not core components, but, uh, no, I meant pairing of a different language, like a, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but, sure. I mean, we can just turn this into, well, first, before we look into actual just looking up programming languages, any questions that are not asking me to Google or asking me to search a language? The, the reason is that oh. Scala derives from a language called Plum. It's not showing up on your list, and I was curious to see if they yeah. what the other Plum is. From pizza. And it's it's a real memory. Yeah, I've never heard of pizza. <laughs> okay, uh, so who had a, uh, you have a question? Yeah, um, just on, on what some of your symbols mean. What's the difference between the green and the blue? Uh, so that is using the Luvian method, which is a method that you can apply across a lot of different nodes um, to determine what communities things are in. Uh, so that is applied across the entire. Well, what's the purple mean versus the green. Uh, so. What's their meaning? I. Uh, the. In this particular example. I. Uh, that they are close in uh, over like they have many overlapping languages. They have a very close knit community. So a algorithm is applied to the entire map. Why do you uh, choose green for some of them and purple for some of them? There's a paragraph in the lower left. Yeah, it, uh, so. Yeah, which I can't read, but that's the yeah. uh, Luvian method for community detection in the network. Yeah, so it uh, goes off of the entire network of uh, nodes and decides which ones have a community and then recursively applies that. So these are two communities. Yes. So yeah, it's that these are, okay. that they are close uh, in the general, in the big picture of things. And the size of the circles? Is the amount of influence they have had for other languages. 
Are all other languages or in your particular example? Uh, all other languages. So this community of blue, because I, like I said, I see fourth up there, and it's in the same community as C and C++ and uh, other things of the like, or purple, like, I guess, compared to blue. Yeah, these what can be more is, contrasted. What is that community defined as? You got BCPL or I don't think it has an API yeah. definition. It's not, it's not like them saying, oh, purple has curly braces. Well, I meant like, is that just low light, low level, level real time? So For the most it part. Says, it says here, edges get the color of the source node. Uh, so the language that influences the other. So I would guess what that means is that they well, probably did the analysis like on C and then found all the things that related to it. And then that okay. was purple. The right. same with Java or whatever else. Well, it's uh, what edges as in the lines going off of it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I'm saying like, it, you know, so uh, the source node is yes. the color, and then they yes. made all of these edges from it, which means I think whatever number of colors there are, let's say there are 10 colors, those are like the 10 like, languages yeah. that they started with, and then drew the map from those. Yeah. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. um, the whether something is part of a community is determined, I've read up on this method that they use, it's determined on like how many nodes overlap. So perhaps if C is influenced by small talk, which also influenced something that influenced C, if there's overlapping communities. Okay. So the closer and closer the nodes are is determines the color. Well, just having used uh, Forest since near the beginning, it didn't seem to have that much affiliation with C. Uh, and it's very different than C. And it, it actually, um, Which one? Fort. It was shown up here somehow. Yeah, and, uh, I zoomed out a little bit. But I've seen it as a very low level language, but it has very little there. In fact, Charles Moore, who invented it, was able to get it to run on a PDP 11 as long as he gave memory. Yeah, that was about it. On that. Back in 1972. Yeah. I realized as soon as I did it, I was like, that is not correct. Yeah, right. Oh, so it's green. Interesting. Oh, that's, that's actually interesting that it inspired Joy, because Joy is one of the languages that went into Haskell. So, yeah. I did not actually know that that's where Joy came from, or one of the things that came from it. I didn't know that. I didn't know about Joy. Yeah, it's uh, some aspects of uh, Joy and ML were some of the things that went into Haskell. Okay. Yeah. What's up? Um, I kind of have two questions. The first one, if I have your thought correctly, I just want to know if you, you saw any like interconnections. There seems to be three basic banks where these languages are emerging from: academics, from real world use cases like necessity for like a business, or for the necessity of the individual. Do you see any like, because those, do, you know, do you have any thoughts on that kind of concept that it, they kind of come from these kind of different places? Uh, so I actually should have copied down some notes from this little thing into here. Um, I would actually say that some of the inspirations for languages have been for academic, business, and government. Okay. It would. Yeah, it was. It would be what I say are the major purposes why they were created, especially some of the early languages um, were like 4chan was in, created for science and math. And that was the main use that it was used for. It was written mostly it was written in mostly by mathematicians. They were not trying to be programmers. It was not trying to make things look like not math. Uh, so Fortran was used by scientists and mathematicians mostly, but uh, Cobalt was created by the government and used for government and business. And that's why a lot of Cobalt still exists in business. Um, so it's just, it depends on where, what they were created by and where is where I think the main things come from. Yeah. And then my second question is kind of, um, 
So there's that, that life cycle from it being like open source. I always wondered, can can like a company like Java didn't I didn't know that until this talk that the JVM wasn't open source until what you said two thousand six? Yeah, two thousand six. Um now what are there certain languages on this list that are very popular that were behind that kind of veil? Um like because I don't really know too much about that, like whether you could patent a language and just use it like could could Google have just patented Go and never released it as open source? Or are there kind of like unknown languages out there that are used at any scale? Um, I'm just curious if you had any like input on that. Hmm. So yes and no. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, exactly that. Um, so it's actually an interesting concept of I don't know if language or any languages have been patented before. That's a seems like an interesting too large of a concept to be under a patent. But, but, isn't, but isn't that how Oracle won their case against Google? Just parts of the job. Parts. Oh, it was copyright. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And like, again, I'm yeah, saying an yeah. entire language is too large of a concept. Yeah. Patents do not exist for that large of things. Copyright is the more important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and copyright can change from version to version. So it's completely possible for Java 6 to become open source because they decided they wanted to change it and change the copyright. Um, for, for most of the history oh. of programming languages, you could not patent languages. Yeah, it, I mean, you could see and the yeah. code. Once you, you could, uh, there were, you, know, you could only patent new ideas. Yes. And by the you know, by 1980, there weren't very many new ideas in programming languages. There were new ways of putting them together. But most of the history of programming languages in terms of new ideas is all prior to 1980. That's an interesting, uh, I don't know if I would fully agree with that, but I also kind of agree with it that a lot of uh, things were created before 1980 and then have just been changed okay, and let me, modified let me, for. Let me just uh, on that slightly. Um, what I thought was not emphasized here and probably the data doesn't capture it, is that a lot of the new ideas came in academic languages. Yes, exactly. And there's an awful lot of academic languages that were very important that I didn't see here at all. Now maybe they're here, but they're not, I think they're they don't small. show up as major because they weren't widely used. Right, uh, I, I mean, they're just small, the community yeah. is small. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, Logo's a, I mean, Logo is a perfect example of that, it was, intended for kids when it was created uh, and not uh, from hugely used. Albo was the most influential language in history, but it doesn't show up very large here. It shows up as being influential but because it was never widely used. Uh, but I think the distinction for that is that there's very different versions of Algol. No, so, no. Well, no, I'm saying Algol might not be the most influential, but Algol 60 is an Algol 68. They all have no. different notes. The first one, the other is derived from it. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it's 60 seconds. But, yeah. but yeah. yes, exactly. Yes. So oh, it's, so it's like just that each version is separated <laughs> by how it influences things. Yeah. Um, versus C is very large because it hasn't had major version changes, we'll say, of C with a completely different name. The different the example of that is C++. Um, or Java is Java 6, Java 7, Java 8. They haven't released it as a totally different language. They've submitted patches and updates to the language that exists. And Algol did not do that. They went off of the naming standard of using the year when they release things. So some of the early languages don't have as large of boxes as you or uh, nodes, as you might expect, just because of the fact of how each language was released and versioned, um, because we hadn't reached semantic versioning at that time. I think we have time for maybe one more question, perhaps one not necessarily related to this yeah. particular visualization. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hi. Uh, does this ever, like, like knowing about the sort of genealogy of languages like this, uh, does it ever influence like the way that you would pick languages for a project? If, if say you had to have a project that was in 
multiple languages? Do you think like, oh, maybe it's better if they're in the same lineage or the same language family or something? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I uh, would definitely choose languages if I had to commit to using many different languages. I would one, look at what the purpose is, because the best thing to do when choosing a language is to know what your purpose of choosing languages. Every language is better at different things. Um, but I would much rather have things that are closer in the same family. Um, so it's not more complex for new uh, developers to join the project and they don't have as much of a learning curve. If you know Java, you can pick up Scala fairly easily. Um, Rust is the new functional C for people who do not know that. So it's like, if you know C, you could probably read some Rust. So it's like having things that are at least similar families definitely makes onboarding much easier. So I would definitely choose to choose language or uh, use languages that are much closer rather than completely far away, unless they are standards and everyone knows them. At that point, it's not as big of a deal, <laughs> but uh, hmm. is that it for questions or? Yeah, I think that's, that's okay. all the time we have for questions. Um, please thank Jenny for... <laughs> I think Jenny can 